Dr. Ming, the great Neil Gabor. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm not gonna say anything profound at the outset. I may not say anything profound through the rest of this conversation, but I will say this. Um, I was profoundly grateful uh, to be the Patrick Henry you know, Writing Fellow when I was there and, uh, and profoundly moved by the experience. It was a wonderful experience. And many of you were the, the contributors to that experience. I made friends and some of whom I see now in this, in this array of mosaic, uh, Zoom mosaic, uh, friends who uh, I, some of whom I still you know, keep in touch with. And um, my memories of, of that period are, are so, so fond. Uh, you know, so I, it was a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. And it was also a major contribution to my work uh, because it did allow me uh, unencumbered to sit in that office from morning till night. And as I said earlier, sometimes from morning till morning, just pouring through materials and, and just you know, analyzing and boring Jennifer Emily, who was, <laughs> who, who was manning that desk at the Star Center every morning as I would, as, as she would arrive or I would arrive, boring her with what I'd discovered uh, the previous day. Uh, she was always, um, she was always a good enough actress not to look bored. Uh, but I, I again, I, I thank all of you. I do feel a part of, of the Washington College family and I'm grateful for the way you welcomed me into your community and for the contributions that you made to the ultimately turned out to be two books. And I'm very happy about this because whenever you're in a situation like a fellowship, um, you always at the back of your mind, you always wonder, um, do your benefactors actually think you're ever going to finish this project? And when you work on a project for 10 years, uh, that becomes a, a more pressing question. But to all my friends and benefactors, here's volume one. Volume two is finished. <laughs> it is already finished and it will be published now. Um, we've delayed the publication um, because of COVID, but it will be published uh, a year from June. So yes, I actually did write this book. I wasn't just taking your, your, your residence and, uh, and your hospitality. I actually was working. And again, I wanna thank all of you from, from really from the bottom of my heart for everything that you did for me and, and the way you, you uh, welcomed me into your community and into your family. And you, and you Adam, uh, as well, were just, I couldn't have asked for a better host. Well, we couldn't have asked for a better um, visitor and we're so proud to have you back. So I'm gonna start the conversation with a pretty basic question, which is who was Ted Kennedy and what drew you to him? And the reason I'm asking that question, so we have some students here with us tonight and our students, some of them were in second grade when Ted Kennedy died in 2009 and may have very few, if any, memories of him. But then those of us from a different generation who um, kind of grew up with Ted Kennedy, I feel like almost you know, took, him for, took him for granted. Um, when I was born in 1970, he'd already been in the Senate uh, for eight years at that point and stayed in the Senate until I was almost 40. So he seemed like a, like a fixture. And you really show us in your magnificent book that we actually don't quite know who Ted Kennedy was. So, so who was he and what drew you to him? Well, let me, let me start with the first part of this because of my own students, uh, and I actually taught a course in writing about politics uh, fairly recently, and uh, I told my students that I was, you know, uh, I'd written a biography of Ted Kennedy and they scratched their heads and they had no idea of who he was. Uh, they vaguely knew that John Kennedy had been assassinated, but that was the extent of their knowledge of the Kennedy. So uh, to those students who have no idea of who Ted Kennedy was, except insofar as he was the brother of the assassinated president, he was the brother of the assassinated president. And was also the brother of the assassinated Senator, Robert Kennedy, who at the time of his assassination was running for the presidency in 1968. Uh, and we often think of him in those terms, that he's the third Kennedy brother. Um, we often think of him in the terms of, well, he's sort of the least of the Kennedys. There was his brother, John, who was president of the United States and who was a towering figure, uh, in some ways, frankly, more towering in death than he was in life. 
but was a towering figure who inspired uh, America. And I was, I'm old enough, you can tell uh, by, the, by my whiskers, that I was old enough you know, to have been one of those who was inspired by John Kennedy, even though I was a, a boy at the time. Um, his impact on the country was real. And I talk about that in the book. And he was the brother of Robert Kennedy, who was also an inspirational figure and, and decided to take on Lyndon Johnson in the 1968 election because as he put it in his, in his quite remarkable speech announcing his candidacy, uh, a, a speech that in some ways prefigures the announcement that Joe Biden made last year. You know, he said, this is an election for the moral leadership of the world and basically whether America deserves that moral leadership. And then you have Ted Kennedy, the surviving brother, the one who wasn't assassinated, the brother who enters the Senate when he's scarcely old enough constitutionally to be a senator, only 30 years old, and, and gets that nomination because guess what? He's the brother of the president and he's a Kennedy. And, and one who is always regarded as the least of the Kennedys, the least in every respect, the least intellectual of the Kennedys. Uh, uh, the least impressive of the Kennedys, um, the, the least politically astute of the Kennedys. Uh, one can go on and on and on in, in that vein, but I chose to write about him. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what, what the origins of this book were, but for those who are trying to contextualize in some way who Ted Kennedy was and and was he just the third brother? Was he just the beneficiary of his brother's political careers and their name and his father's fortune? Um, the answer is no. The answer is no. And in fact, I would, I would make the argument, and I do make the argument in this book, that while we assume we read John and Robert forward into Ted, and we impute them into Ted, in actuality, I believe we impute Ted back into Robert and John, by which I mean Ted was the most liberal of the Kennedy brothers. He was the most productive of the Kennedy brothers. As a legislator, he was arguably, and I think it'd be hard to argue the other side of it, but I'm being charitable here. He was arguably the most successful senator in the history of the Senate introducing some 2,500 pieces of legislation and passing some 700. And the list of accomplishments, you know, when you think of senators, most senators don't have a single accomplishment legislatively. Some have one accomplishment that they constantly seize upon, like McCain-Feingold had. Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy had a list that is as long as, as my arm. I mean, the National Cancer Act, Meals on Wheels, uh, COBRA, HIPAA, uh, arguably the most important thing he'd done, which is the Children's Health you know, Insurance Program, which gave health insurance to children whose parents were too wealthy to qualify for Medicaid but too poor to really provide medical insurance. That program is still in existence and tens of millions of children have benefited from it. Uh, you know, I could go on and on and on, but the point is this, this man, and, and I'm quoting here uh, Bob Schieffer of CBS at the time of his death, this man probably affected more lives, more lives, than any single American politician. And the only exception I, I would make to that is possibly Franklin Roosevelt. But I think with the exception of Franklin Roosevelt, at least in the 20th century, no American politician affected lives as deeply as Ted Kennedy, as many lives as Ted Kennedy. And almost no one who's listening to me even now has not had his or her life affected in some way by Ted Kennedy. Now, you also answered what attracted me to him in this book. That's, I'm, I'm giving a very long-winded 
you know, answer. And, and I don't want to put anybody to sleep. Um, so I'll try and be very brief, Adam, in this, in this portion of the, this is like one of those three-part questions when, when you're writing an essay. So here's part three. Part three is this. I did not embark on this book because I was necessarily fascinated by Ted Kennedy. I was fascinated by the Kennedys, um, as everybody, as I said, in my generation was. And I'll tell you something that I almost never talk about, but I'm among friends now, so I'll, I'll mention it here. Um, uh, I, when I was a, a very young, I was a freshman in college, um, I traveled the country uh, working in Robert Kennedy's campaign, presidential campaign. And I was in the room when Robert Kennedy was shot. Um, as I say, that's not something I've, I talk about in, in other interviews. So uh, the Kennedys held a fascination for me, but I did not write this book because I wanted to write a monument to Ted Kennedy or because I was fascinated by Ted Kennedy. All of my books are generated not by the figure about whom I'm writing, but by a question that I want to pursue. And the figure about whom I write is someone who allows me to examine and I hope illuminate an issue. And the, the, the question I asked in this book, the question I hope to answer in this book, if you read both volumes, and that takes a great deal of patience, almost as much patience as it took me to write the books. The question I asked was this, I think it's the, and I think it's the critical question of the last 50 years of American politics. What happened to American liberalism? What happened to American liberalism? Franklin Roosevelt really is the originator of modern American liberalism. And he used government activism to help Americans through the Great Depression. In the course of Ted Kennedy's career, when he entered the Senate late in 1962, he was, he was elected in 62 and entered the Senate early to get seniority. His, his predecessor happened to be John Kennedy's roommate in college. So he left the office to allow Ted to do that. When he entered office, John Kennedy was president. And what was known as the liberal consensus, by which meant that even Republicans signed on to the fact that the New Deal was a fact of American life and they weren't about to rescind it. It was at something near its high watermark. The high watermark actually came a few years later with Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. And in the course of that career, as you pointed out, Adam, a 47 year career, liberalism was almost extinguished. And the second volume, volume one is called Catching the Wind. Volume two, as you might guess, is called Against the Wind because most of Ted Kennedy's career was sailing against the conservative wind. So I thought looking at this life, looking at liberalism through the prism of this life, I might be able to answer the question that so absolutely um, engrossed me. And that is, what happened to this thing, this prevailing ideology in America, where today nearly half of Americans regard it as the equivalent of communism? Liberalism, you mean? What happened? Well, yeah, and one of the quotes that really stands out from your book is you say Ted Kennedy accomplished what his brothers could not. Um, that really, really hit home for me. But I want to ask you, I want to pivot for a moment away from these sort of theoretical um, political questions to the life of this man, which um, was fascinating as well. And I mean, he had a front row seat on American history from the time he was a toddler, let alone what he experienced as an adult on world history, really, snuggling up with the Pope on the sofa and visiting the King and Queen. The, the, Pope, the but, Pope gave him his communion. Amazing. That Pope. So, so he came from this family that was sort of storied in its wealth, its glamour, its connections, but his early life was really anything but idyllic. He struggled a lot against a number of things. And could you tell us about those early years? Well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to proceed this by saying one thing. 
And, and it may sound uh, ridiculous or corny, or you may challenge it, but I, I feel that greatness, political greatness, is often the function of great suffering because it, it often is the case that those who suffer understand the suffering of others and try and use the instruments of their power to help those individuals. I know I'm sounding like a, an ardent liberal here, but frankly, I am an ardent liberal, so I will confess to that. You know, we, we look at Franklin Roosevelt as being the prime example of inf how infantile paralysis was translated into his understanding of the handicaps of, of Americans general. You know, you think of Ted Kennedy, as you said, of being the, the prince of this family, this incredibly wealthy family, and, and living a life of absolute ease, a childhood in which he had to worry about nothing. The road to Harvard was paved. <laughs> it wasn't as wasn't if Kennedy's had to work to get into Harvard, even if they weren't intellectually uh, equipped to do so. And they weren't great students. None of them were really great students, but he was the worst of all of them. Uh, but Ted Kennedy, for all these ideas, this mythology of how privileged he was, how easy everything was. You know, I said earlier, he was the least. He was the least of the Kennedys, not only outside the Kennedy family, he was regarded as the least of the Kennedys within the Kennedy family. He was the youngest, obviously, <clears throat> but he was also an afterthought, literally an afterthought because Joe and Rose thought that their childbearing days were, were finished. And then lo and behold, on what uh, Joe Kennedy's biographer, David Nassau speculates was just a, a rare physical encounter between Joe and Rose. They had stopped having any kind of physical relationship long before this, but they happen to meet up and they have a rare physical encounter. And lo and behold, out of that rare physical encounter, this child is born that no one expected. And no one really wanted, to be perfectly frank. And Ted's childhood, in the much overworked term, is very Dickensian because he's left to his own devices. We think of Rose Kennedy as being this sort of doting and, and somewhat fey mother, you know, a, a, a real a character. Uh, that is, a, a, in my estimation, an absolute mischaracterization of who Rose Kennedy was. Rose Kennedy was an aesthete. Rose Kennedy was dedicated to aesthetics. The aesthetics of herself, no one bought more clothes than Rose Kennedy, and the aesthetics of her family. And she treated her family as if it were an aesthetic object. But while her dedication to the family was an aesthetic one, their teeth had to be brushed. They had to be neatly clothed, although John Kennedy was always disheveled. <laughs> he, he violated those rules. Uh, while they had to be healthy, while they had to be vigorous, all of these things that we identify with the Kennedys were things that were not organic to the Kennedys. They were imposed upon them, imposed upon them because Rose and to a lesser extent, Joe, wanted this aesthetic object to show the world. Partly, parenthetically, to show the world, not that the Kennedys were necessarily great, although they did want that, but to show the world that Irish Catholics could be great, which was an ongoing festering resentment that the Kennedys carried with them, particularly Joe. You know, one could even say that his, his ambitions for his sons were a way to redress the humiliations that he felt he had suffered as an Irish Catholic. But Ted Kennedy, the least of the Kennedys, was kind of ignored. Rose went off into Europe and she would gallivant around the country. And it was interesting as well. Now imagine this, if Rose was at Hyannis, then Ted was at school in Hyannis. But in mid-season, Rose decided she wanted to go to Palm Beach. So what did she do? 
hey, Ted, in the middle of the semester, come down to Palm Beach. And she'd be down to Palm Beach for a couple of months. And, you know, well, then let's go go back to Hyannis. Sometimes she was in Europe. So she deposited at boarding school. He was in boarding school. And he's a little kid. And, and there's one instance that I discuss in the book that Ted often talked about, where he was put in, in Portsmouth uh, uh, Prairie School with, with Bobby, because that's where Bobby was going to school. Um, but the problem was that Ted was four years younger than every other student at the school. And that was a humiliation for him. But Rose didn't care. And so you have this, this boy who grows up basically friendless, uh, an outsider in many respects, even within his own family. His nickname in the family was Biscuits and Muffins. Why? Because he was the fat Kennedy. There were no fat Kennedys. Kennedys were lean and handsome and muscular and all. No, he was the fat Kennedy. And, and, his, and his siblings made fun of him. He was a pet, sort of, a, a kind of cute pet, but he was also a source of their ridicule. And, you know, a, a, a story that, that Ted also liked to tell. Ted had these stories of humiliation that he often told which the fact that he told them so often seems to me to underscore just how severe the humiliation was. Although I want to add that in the Kennedy family, no one could ever admit to humiliation because Kennedys couldn't be humiliated. Kennedys were stoic. Kennedys were strong. But there's a story he, he told, which always just struck me, where he had a pet turtle when he was at one of his boarding schools. And he loved this turtle because the turtle was the only bond he had. This other students ridiculed him in the same way his family had. He was always an outsider, always an outsider. And at one point, the turtle died. And the students took the turtle and started playing hockey with it. And it was, again, a point of devastation for Ted. But that's one story of many of the kind of childhood Ted Kennedy had, which was distant, friendless, uh, 11 schools, I think in eight years he attended, uh, unrooted, absolutely rootless. That's the childhood that Ted Kennedy had. And it's significant. It's significant because those humiliations, that sense of outsiderness, all of that, which neither Jack nor Bobby had, are ways, I think, in which Ted honed his sensitivity. Of all the Kennedys, Ted Kennedy knew what it was like to be humiliated, to suffer, to be underestimated, to be considered the least, which is one of the chapter titles here. Well, you know, when you started saying um, Rose Kennedy was an esthete, I thought you were going to say she was an ass something else. <laughs> because she really doesn't come off well in this book. She really does not. She's but I have, uh, I have just, um, I, have, I have two or if we have time, three questions for you before I want to make sure that we um, have time in, in the second half here to open it up to other folks. Question. So one is, you know, lest we get too sympathetic with Ted Kennedy and his and his pet turtle, he doesn't <laughs> come off sympathetically in your book. I mean, there was good Ted and then there was bad Ted throughout his life. And um, could you talk about bad Ted a little bit, where that came from and, and how that shaped his life? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Look, it, I, I, I'm not, if you're looking for hagiography, you're looking at the wrong book. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of, frankly, in my career is that um, almost everyone who's ever reviewed my books or whatever, you know, always says that uh, they always call me even handed and um, that I, I, I never, I, you know, I would not write a book about someone in whom I sat in great admiration um, because uh, I, I would not write a book in which I'd already prejudged the individual. Part of the adventure and excitement of a book is following the trail of that individual and finding out where that trail leads. 
And if you've prejudged everything, it then means that you take all of the information and you conform it to that vision. But I want my vision to form as I write the book. So is there bad Ted Kennedy? Absolutely. Is there reckless Ted Kennedy? Absolutely. Is there Ted Kennedy uh, who uh, was particularly, and I, I discussed this at some length in the book, was particularly cruel to his wife, to Joan Kennedy, inexcusably cruel to Joan Kennedy, who was an alcoholic, which is an illness, but it was not an illness that Kennedys could tolerate because Kennedys believed that, you know, you are always in control of yourself. And though Ted himself was quite a drinker, he was a controlled drinker most of the time and his wife was not. And so, you know, there, when you look at things that are inexcusable about Ted, there is a recklessness to him. Um, and there's a cruelty to him at times. For a man who is so big hearted in dealing with other individuals publicly, in dealing with the voiceless, the powerless, the marginalized, and he was very kind and sincerely so, that that aspect of Ted Kennedy was absolutely sincere. He could be just as cruel to members of his own family. He was pretty cruel to his son, Patrick, who suffered as, as we know from uh, you know, drug addiction and, and, other, and other issues. And Ted was extremely intolerant of that. Saying, as Patrick Kennedy told me, that he was always afraid you know, that Patrick would turn into Joan. Now, the, the conservative spin on this, particularly on Chappaquiddick, which is such a complicated issue, and I, and I talk about it at some length in the book, because Chappaquiddick, regardless of what it did in Ted Kennedy's life, changed American politics. And, and tell us what happened, because our younger... Uh, yeah, that's right. I, you know, I, I forget, Adam. You know, Chappaquiddick, to give you the, the, um, the Cliff Notes version, Chappaquiddick is an island. Uh, off of Martha's Vineyard. And Ted Kennedy uh, went there to Martha's Vineyard to sail in a regatta. And there had been organized a, uh, a, a, a party, so to speak. It was more like a wake than a party of women who had worked in Bobby Kennedy's campaign. This was the summer after Bobby Kennedy's death. This was in July of 1969. Bobby Kennedy was, uh, died in June of 1968. And so these women who had worked in Bobby Kennedy's campaign, uh, they, they were invited to, uh, to this little get together, almost as a way to exorcise their pain over Bobby's death. And Ted attended, and Ted left that party with one of those women. Uh, I'm not going to say I, I'm not, I don't want to get into, again, all the particulars of were they having an affair, whatever. I don't believe they were. And I, in the book, you know, I, I think I litigate Chappaquiddick about as fairly as anybody possibly could. But what happened was that they were driving off, Ted said, to catch the ferry back to the mainland. And there a, a, was a very narrow bridge over a, a pond. And Ted as he later claimed that he took a wrong turn and the car sailed off the pond and overturned in the water, which was very, had a very stiff current. And though he claimed that he tried repeatedly to save the young woman, one of Bobby Kennedy's uh, former staffers, campaign staffers, he could not pull her out of the, the car and she drowned. And that episode became known as Chappaquiddick. Um, and although initially there was sympathy for Ted, oh, another Kennedy tragedy. Um, in point of fact, it wasn't Kennedy's tragedy. It was the tragedy of the young woman, Mary Jo Kopechny, who died. And the media response to Chappaquiddick quickly changed from sympathy for Ted to excoriating Ted for having you know, murdered this, this woman, which clearly he did not do. 
Um, but but the take on this was that this was a, an example somehow of, of Ted's recklessness or whatever. Um, it is an example of the way in which Ted always seemed to get himself into scrapes. Uh, when he was at Harvard as a freshman, uh, he was caught in a cheating scandal and was expelled from Harvard for having someone take a Spanish exam for him. Um, this incident on Chappaquiddick was yet another you know, incident. And later on in his, in his life, and, uh, he had a, an episode in which his nephew was accused of raping uh, a woman at, um, at Palm Beach. And, uh, and Ted had been with his nephew and his son that evening. And so he got embroiled in that, even though he was really only very tangentially involved. Now, now to, to address your question, Adam, which is not just you know, stating the narrative of it, but the, the idea of bad Ted, which is a very legitimate idea. Uh, I love what, what the, the columnist Richard Reeves said uh, of, of Ted Kennedy. He called him a publicly moral man. I think that's absolutely true. Whether he's a privately moral man or not is, is I think, uh, questionable. But the, the conservative argument is Ted felt privileged. He was reckless. He thought he could do anything he wanted to do and get away with anything. Uh, from what I know of Ted Kennedy, uh, and this does not exonerate him. I just want to emphasize that. I think that's completely false. Of all the Kennedys, and Kennedys felt privileged. But Ted was the one who felt least privileged. Ted was the Kennedy who always flew coach, never flew first class. And, 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 and that, that in some ways, you know, is, is telling. Here's what I believe of Ted Kennedy. I believe that Ted Kennedy had such a deep inferiority complex, particularly vis-a-vis -vis his, his older brothers whom he worshiped, that Ted Kennedy always felt he had to sin to be redeemed. And so much of Ted Kennedy's life is predicated in a very Catholic sense on redemption, on finding redemption. But in order to find redemption, you have to prove, you have to do something from which you can get redeemed. In some ways, this becomes a paradigm of Ted Kennedy's entire life. Because one could say, one could make the argument, I do, one could make the argument that Ted Kennedy's entire life is an act of redemption. That everything he did for those marginalized, and powerless and voiceless individuals was a one was was one long lifelong act of redemption to say you know i'm not the least i i i did awful things i'm not a worthy human being but these are efforts to do my very best to prove my worthiness my brothers didn't have to do that because they were better than I am. But I have to do it because I'm just not that good. Well, Neil, I'll just ask you um, one more question because I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to ask their own questions and join the conversation. Um, and um, that is, you know, you and I talked a little bit before um, this event began about just when you're working on a long book, just the prolonged agonies and very intermittent um, <laughs> joys and exhilaration when you find that document in an archive or do that interview. And I wonder if you could tell us uh, about one moment, maybe your favorite moment in working on the book that was just a eureka for you. You know, there's, you know you're absolutely right, Adam. And, and, and of course, when you're assembling a life, and that's really what you're doing here, you're assembling a life, um, you could, give, you, you could give anyone in, in this Zoom session the same pieces that I was given and you would come up with a different assemblage than the one I came up with. So when we talk about definitive biography, um, there is really no such thing. Um, what there is is a, you know, different assemblages. And so every time you're finding something, you say, oh my gosh, this, this, is, this shows me this or this tells me this. And, and as you pointed out early on, and as I say explicitly in the book, the Ted Kennedy that I knew, the, Ted, the public Ted Kennedy, the kind of, of uh, you know, hail fellow well-met Ted Kennedy, a guy who loved to sing Sweet Adeline and all that stuff, um, you know, is not the Ted Kennedy I discover here. 
the Ted Kennedy I discovered as I went through this life was a, was a much more melancholy and, and at times even maudlin man, a great fatalist. But I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a story now that was probably the most striking thing. It's a, it's a little long, but I'm, I'll do my best to cram it in. It's, it's, a, it's something, it's a piece of information I found. When Ted Kennedy, in the 19, late 1980s and 19, early 1990s, Ted was in the political wilderness because the Reagan years had, had marginalized him. And it, it, it basically eviscerated liberalism. The very thing to which Ted Kennedy had dedicated his life was virtually powerless. He couldn't do the things he wanted to do. And you'll, and, and you'll notice, and this comes in volume two, and I, I talk about it at great length. Volume two, by the way, is longer than volume one, so I, I'm warning you. <laughs> but, but how Ted Kennedy during the Reagan years would seize on moral issues that he thought Reagan and the conservatives you know, would, would have a very difficult time challenging. But Ted was in... in the political wilderness, and he was also in a personal wilderness. His marriage to Joan had fallen apart. Uh, his sense of purpose was uh, shaky. And he was, he was you know, I, I dissolute may be too strong a word, uh, and it is too strong a word, but th there was a sense of dissolution to him. And it was in this period that a journalist by the name of Michael Kelly uh, wrote an article about Ted in um, Gentleman's Quarterly called Teddy on the Rocks. And Kelly was, a, was an ambitious and opportunistic young journalist and he understood what this would do for his career. Uh, and basically what he did was um, he destroyed Ted Kennedy. He destroyed Ted Kennedy. The article, and you can see my examination of the sourcing of the article if you're interested. You can Google the piece I wrote. I had a Shorenstein Fellowship at Harvard when I wrote this book as well. And my project at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard was uh, Edward Kennedy in the press. And I took four events from his life and showed how the press covered these events and what they meant for the relationship between Ted Kennedy and the press. And, um, and in that, I discussed this article that Michael Kelly wrote in which, you know, I, I mean, he, he basically says if Ted Kennedy sneezed, it was to give people tuberculosis. I mean, there was nothing, nothing that Ted Kennedy could do right. I mean, this was, you know, Ted Kennedy was a, a drunkard. He was a womanizer. He was a borderline rapist. It was all of that stuff. I go through the sourcing of the book and uh, of the article and I, I demonstrate there that not a single thing he does was, was a first, was a witnessed source. Everything was secondhand, thirdhand or fourthhand, whatever. Be that as it may. It hurt Ted Kennedy deeply and personally. As one might expect. Here was a guy who was living his life toward redemption and now comes this article, which says that he's a staggering alcoholic bum, basically. And it affected the image of Ted Kennedy. It deeply affected the image of Ted Kennedy nationally. Because another thing I did was I sourced how many times people would discuss, in the New York Times for that matter, would discuss Ted Kennedy's so-called dissolution. And it always came back to this article. Nobody from the New York Times went and did any independent reporting. Oh, Ted Kennedy's a bum. And here's the person I talked to. It all went back to Michael Kelly. That article was the kind of, of Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone of destroying Ted Kennedy. All right. Michael Kelly, for whom I have no fondness whatsoever. Michael Kelly was a cheerleader for the Iraq war which Ted Kennedy fiercely opposed. By the way, Michael Kelly's career, you know, skyrocketed after this. He became an editor at the New Republic. 
He wrote for Atlantic. You know, I mean, he, he became a darling in, in the media, basically by eviscerating liberal figures. That's what he did. That was his stock and trade. So now it's the war in Iraq. And he likes that war. And he goes there to cover the war. In, in, in fairness to him, I mean, that's, that's a somewhat honorable thing. If you love the war, you know, it's, it's best to be there on, on the ground rather than love it from a distance as so many others do. He goes there early in the war. I think it was April. And uh, he's in a, a Humvee and the Humvee comes under attack. And the driver is zigzagging and uh, he hits a, uh, a canal or a trench and the Humvee overturns and Michael Kelly is killed. Michael Kelly is killed. At the time, Michael Kelly was writing for the Atlantic and at that time, the Atlantic was not based in Washington, but it was based in Boston. So Michael Kelly was a constituent of Ted Kennedy. Now, Ted Kennedy had every reason in the world to despise this man more than anyone in his life, probably. That night, Michael Kelly's widow gets a phone call. It is Ted Kennedy. And he tells her, you know, I share your, your grief and I'm very sorry. And I want to know this. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do? And she says, in point of fact, there is. I think I'm going to have some difficulty getting his body out of Iraq. There's so much red tape involved. And Ted Kennedy says, consider it done. And it was. And that to me, you ask me, Adam, what's, what's, what did I find? That to me is in many respects the quintessential Ted Kennedy story. The quintessential story. Ted Kennedy was not a hater. He didn't know how to hate. He only knew how to give. And though there was bad Ted, reckless Ted, seeking redemption Ted, that story about the man who probably, again, deserved to hate more than anybody else, the man who did more to try and destroy Ted Kennedy than any single individual. That's what he did. That's what he did. It's, it's fascinating and, and a moving story um, that we can look forward to in, in the next volume. It's in volume two. I've already given away. Spoiler alert, it's in volume two. <laughs> well, um, so many more questions that I'm sure from the, um, from the other um, participants here tonight as well. Some are already coming in in the chat, so folks should feel free to add those or um, raise, your, raise your hand. Um, we have a question um, from Mark Schulman. What lessons can we learn from Ted Kennedy about how to sail against the wind in Congress? And I should say that Mark is somebody with his own um, distinguished career in the, in the political world. And so this may be a very pragmatic question for him. Mark, that's a great question. And it's one of the reasons I, I wrote the book, in fact. Um, one of the things that Ted Kennedy always understood, if we look at these principles, I mean, Ted Kennedy, as I said, was a master legislator. Um, what makes a master legislator? What made him so successful? There were a number of things. Some were just personal characteristics. He was, he knew how to be deferential. <laughs> you know, he was not only young, but he was deferential. He knew how to work the, the Senate. Um, you know, I, I often think, and I do this in the book, you know, you compare Lyndon Johnson, uh, Robert Carroll's Lyndon Johnson of master of the Senate, who was a master manipulator, but basically manipulated through intimidation. He twisted arms. He, he you know, kind of faced you down. Uh, Ted Kennedy was no less a master of the Senate and did it for a lot longer than Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was a master of the Senate for really a handful of years. Um, but Ted Kennedy did it for, you know, 40 years. Ted Kennedy's style, 
And this is something that, you know, I, I think resonates today with the current occupant of the White House, who himself has said that Ted Kennedy was a kind of mentor for him. But Ted Kennedy's style was, you don't intimidate. You try and understand. You know, uh, you, you, you work with people and you ingratiate, not intimidate. And Ted was a great ingratiator. What made it even more powerful was that it was sincere. I mean, yes, it was a device, but he sincerely liked people. And he would always say, he would always say, when he'd sit down with his staff and he'd work on a, on a bill, he'd introduce a bill or was working on the introduction of a bill, he'd say, find me a Republican. It was always find me a Republican. And though it was a hell of a lot easier in those days, in, vir it's, in fact, it's virtually impossible in these days. And I don't know how Ted would navigate this whole Senate now, but, but he'd sit down with that Republican. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story because I love this story. Chip, the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, was co-sponsored by Orrin Hatch, an ultra-conservative who believed in no government activism whatsoever. You couldn't get more conservative than Orrin Hatch. So how does Ted get Orrin Hatch to co-sponsor this? Well, I, I want to give you two examples. Again, this is in volume two, but I think it's really instructive of, uh, to, to your point, Mark. Number one, he said, what does Orrin Hatch want? Now, Orrin Hatch really doesn't care all that much about making sure that children get insurance. But you know what Orrin Hatch does? Orrin Hatch is a Mormon. He's from Utah. He hates smoking. He really hates smoking. So what does Ted Kennedy do? He goes to Orrin Hatch and he says, look, at, you know, I, I've got this bill. And I, this is how I want to finance it. I want to finance it with a steep tax on cigarettes. Orrin Hatch says, go. Now this, now he warms to this idea. Oh, a steep tax on cigarettes that will discourage people from smoking. <laughs> and we'll take that tax and we're going to funnel it in to funding this health insurance program. And then what else does he do? He had on his staff a man by the name of Nick Littlefield. And I saw Ted Widmer is here. And I know that Ted was a friend of Nick Littlefield's. And Nick Littlefield was in a previous life before his political life, he was a singer and actually a Broadway performer. I mean, a, a professional singer. Ted took Littlefield to Orrin Hatch's office. Now, why? Because Orrin Hatch composed songs. This is a little known fact about Orrin Hatch, but Orrin Hatch was a composer. And what Ted would do is he would have Nick Littlefield learn an Orrin Hatch song. So when they'd go to discuss the <laughs> chip and how to get, he'd have Nick Littlefield come in and start singing an Orrin Hatch song. And so here are two things, you know, ways of working, ways of working Orrin Hatch <laughs> with smoking and with singing. Now, that's how Ted Kennedy did it. But there's something else. Mark, there's something else. And it's something I feel very, very, very strongly about. So strongly about, I mean, it, it, it runs through the book. Um, and that is something that, something that Joe Biden said at the dedication of the Edward Kennedy Legislative, Legislative Institute, when he was discussing the things that he had learned from Ted Kennedy. And he said this, he said, uh, it is very hard to be petty when the person you are debating is so magnanimous. Ted Kennedy was a genuinely magnanimous man. And the moral authority that Ted Kennedy had was extremely powerful in working the Senate and even working some of those Republicans. Because when Republicans, and there were many Republicans, even though they used him for their fundraising and everything else, it, was, it became a joke of Ted Kennedy. You know, Republican would come up to him, you know, you're in my fundraising about how we can't let Ted Kennedy take over the country. 
And Ted would laugh and says, well, if you're going to use me, use me. You know, I mean, it was, it became a joke. But after Ted Kennedy's death, how many Republicans came out and said how much they admired him? Now, what did they admire about him? They disagreed with him on almost every single thing. But they admired the public morality of this man. And, you know, I raise that because uh, those of you who heard me talk about the book uh, know that this is a book about Ted Kennedy. But it is every bit as much a book about public morality. And Ted Kennedy was one of the great exemplars of public morality and how you use it to get things done. And almost every single thing, I can tell you, they're, they're all in the book, but I can tell you, not all of them, but the many of them, I can tell you story after story after story of the ways in which Ted used public morality and even private morality, giving people credit. Ted never took credit. You know, the, 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 the uh, HIPAA bill was Kassenbaum Kennedy, not Kennedy Kassenbaum, Kennedy originated that bill, but he made sure that Nancy Kassenbaum had her name first. He always did that. He always did that. He said, I don't need the credit. I want to pass the bill. That's so those are just little ways. I mean, the, the, the books, I hope, Mark, are a kind of primer in the way in which you can work the Senate. But I am not naive enough to believe that Ted Kennedy could have operated in this Senate. This is not about sailing against the wind. This is about being destroyed by a gale. And, you know, if there were a third volume and he was trying to function, you know, it'd be about his boat sinking, unfortunately. Wow. Well, um, we're, we're coming um, close to our, our time limit um, here. We can run a little bit over because I see a few more questions. And um, I should also say that as per Star Center custom, if there are Washington College students with questions, we will let you um, cut in line and don't be bashful <laughs> about that because we really like um, hearing, from, hearing from students. We'll try to hear from everybody who has a remaining question. But Bob Ingersoll, you have a question. Yes. Um, the the title of your book has got a double meaning in my mind because in 2001, Ted Kennedy was very powerful in the Senate on energy and he was also a alternative energy advocate until it came to Cape Wind, which was right across from his view shed. <laughs> and he worked for 10 years to destroy that. How do you square that with the good Ted? I think I, you square it that Ted Kennedy um, was also self-interested and, uh, you know, he was a human being. Um, I, I think, you know, to, to try and make excuses for him is, um, you know, is lame and I won't. Um, you know, I think the balance sheet of all of our lives is indeed a balance sheet. And we all look at our lives and say, you know, did, did, did we do more good than not? Um, I think Ted Kennedy had a pretty good balance sheet, but perfection was far from, from him. I mean, uh, he's an extremely imperfect man, but I will say this, Bob, I think it was his imperfections. You, you look at Bobby Kennedy and you look at John Kennedy, and though in hindsight, we know things particularly about John, uh, that make him less than perfect, and, and about Bobby and his relationship to Martin Luther King Jr. and, and that. Um, Ted understood he was imperfect. And in point of fact, we understood he was imperfect. And it was part of the, the way in which the bond that he formed, when those crowds, when those crowds lined those streets, which is how I begin the book, for his funeral. They weren't lining the streets because he was a saint, as they did, as they felt they did in Washington when they were lining the streets for John Kennedy, or when they were lining the railroad tracks for Robert Kennedy on the funeral train that, that took him from New York City to Washington 
They were lining those streets because they felt this Kennedy is scaled to us. We understand this Kennedy's imperfect. This Kennedy does wrong things. This Kennedy drove a woman off of the Chappaquiddick Bridge. This Kennedy drinks too much. This Kennedy does things, as you point out, you know, that are self-interested. This Kennedy scaled to us. This Kennedy is an imperfect man, but so are we. And we understand that about him, which is why he becomes a kind of, he becomes our Kennedy in a way that John and Robert could never be, frankly. They were too saintly for that. But this guy, this guy was no saint in almost all respects, except in the general political sense. We have a question from Jim Bogdan in, in Chestertown. How did Kennedy become such a powerful orator? You know, he worked at it. And, and, I, and I, I'll tell you, I, I say that not glibly, but because Ted Kennedy had to work at everything. And it's one of the, the things that, that you, I, I think speaks to how he achieved even his, his legislative successes. Ted was not a natural except a natural politician. I mean, I, I know in Ted Widmer's book on, on uh, uh, John Kennedy's tapes, I, I, I think he, he says at one point, he, he's the most natural politician in the family. And, and Joe Kennedy said the same thing about him. You know, Ted, he said, is the most brilliant of my sons. I don't think he meant that in an intellectual sense, but I think he meant it in, he's the most brilliant politically of my sons. He really understands politics. But though he was a natural there, he was a natural in almost nothing else. He wasn't a natural legislatively. He wasn't a natural in mastering, you know, the, the issues but he worked so hard. And the story I tell in the book, I have a whole chapter on it. When Ted Kennedy, we, many of us forget this. And of course the students who are listening no, would, wouldn't even remember this because they, they could, can't forget it because they wouldn't remember it. But he was in a, a plane crash in 1964 that almost cost him his life. I mean, he broke his back. He came within an inch of losing his life. And one of our friends, and Chesterton, Birch Bai, uh, whom I interviewed at, at length for this book, was the one who pulled Kennedy out of the wreckage because Birch Bai, they were on their way to the Massachusetts Democratic State Convention where Birch Bai was going to be the keynote speaker. Oh, Neil, you seem to have frozen. We may have lost Neil. Let's hang on for a moment and see if he can come back. In the meantime, um, if anybody has any comments that they want to, to offer, and I know that we um, have somebody here, um, Stan Sillette, who actually worked with, with Ted Kennedy on his 1980 campaign. And, and uh, we have Ted Widmer, who um, wrote a book about the Kennedys um, and perhaps others who have Kennedy connections as well. And I, I wonder if um, any of you have any any thoughts to add as we um, wait for Neil to come back. Well, I, I can't wait to hear the Birch Bay story. And I mentioned him last week and how privileged I felt to get to know him and you knew him very well, Adam. And we're once again about to hear how central Chestertown is to the universe, right when the internet stopped working for, um, for, for Neil. But um, what, a, what an amazing presentation. I, I felt like I, I've read almost every book on Ted Kennedy there is. I already have heard so much that I, I didn't know. Can't wait to read the book. Thanks, Ted. And Adam, Ted, yeah, sorry, Stan, go ahead. Uh, I think I'd be interested in Neil Gabler's discussion of the, of the three different Kennedys in terms of their campaign and campaign organizations. How they related to each other. You what know, was, he, 
what was the 1980 campaign um, like from your front row seat? And you were the deputy campaign chair in 1980 for Ted I, I, was, I was a deputy finance chair. Finance chair. Well, uh, being, being in a Kennedy campaign uh, was like being in an archeological dig because there was, there was a JFK layer of people around who felt that they had all the right to advise both the Bobby campaign people and the Teddy campaign people. And finally, when it came to Teddy, you had all these other advisors from previous Kennedy administrations or eras. And, uh, and in my view, it's, it's sort of an untold story of that dynamic because it never went away. It was always present. Oh. I'd be you know, interested in Neil's, whether he, he ran across this as part of his book. Neil mentioned my book in a line where I said JFK was the most natural politician of, of the three, but I, I think there are different kinds of political genius. And I think JFK was a natural executive. I'm not aware that he was the greatest Senator, even though he wrote a book about being in the Senate and Profiles and Courage is mostly about senators, maybe entirely about senators. Um, but JFK was very good at running for office and Ted Kennedy struggled. I, I volunteered in the 1980 campaign, but I remember that feeling of, um, I mean, there was the famous interview with Roger Mudd, he wasn't that good at saying why he wanted to run. <laughs> and I found a tape when I was working on that book about 10 years ago that John F. Kennedy was at a dinner party in Georgetown and just poured out all of the reasons he wanted to be president, just to be in the center of everything. You know, he's like an older sibling, not the oldest, but wanted to be in the center of attention. And I think Ted was really a natural, a, a genius of legislation, as Neil was saying. And so they were each very natural, but in different spheres. And I think Bobby Kennedy was maybe a different kind of natural politician. He was way more comfortable with the marginalized peoples of America than John F. Kennedy ever would have been. And they really were a very diverse group of peoples from poor whites in Appalachia, Mississippi, to Native Americans. He loved Native Americans. They, they couldn't do anything for him electorally. John F. Kennedy never would have spent as much time with Native Americans as Bobby Kennedy did. And I'm not sure Ted Kennedy would have either because they represented no strength in the Senate. But Bobby Kennedy had a kind of visceral need to be around the marginalized peoples. He was almost more like a, a saint figure. I mean, he wasn't a saint, but, but um, a different kind of um, pure Democrat connected to the people in a, in a way that wasn't quite what Ted Kennedy was or what John F. Kennedy was. And it's really interesting to see the three siblings so different from each other. And, and Ted, I know that you're friends with some of the Kennedys um, and you, um, you know, you've, you've played touch football at Hickory Hill, I think, or, or been around touch football at Hickory Hill and um, been kind of in that charmed circle. And I wonder if, uh, I'm not asking you to spill any tea on your friends um, in the family, but um, I wonder what you saw, you know, Neil talked about his relationship with his family in his early years. I wonder what you saw of his relationship with especially the, the younger Kennedys and the Kennedys who were entering politics um, towards the end of his life. Well, well, sure, I'm happy to say anything about what I know. There, there are limits to what I know. I mean, there are a lot of Kennedys in, in our generation and I know a few of them, not, not that many. I know one of the younger sons of Robert Kennedy. His name is Max Kennedy. I know him extremely well. He's a very close friend. Most of the other siblings, I, I don't know well, although I, I got to know Kathleen when I lived in Chestertown and she was Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. I, I remember getting to know her and she's, she's great. Um, but I think one thing that is important about Ted Kennedy is that he really took seriously his, his job as an uncle. And so the family was 
devastated, of course, by the, the loss of JFK and RFK. I think Neil's coming back, but Ted Kennedy really stepped up as an uncle to all of these fatherless young, young children. A lot of them were boys. They were kind of, you know, wild boys growing up and they'd all sort of get dropped off at Hyannisport. And he was a really good role model, I, I think. I mean, I know they all looked up to him a, a lot. And that was a big job to be kind of step in, a fill in father for 15 people. But I, I know they all really revered him um, all, all the way into their own adulthood. And now they're all, they're all parents themselves. I apologize, my, as, as you can tell, my, my Wi-Fi went out uh, <laughs> in mid-sentence. I was talking about how hard Ted Kennedy worked. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and my point was that uh, where I, just to pick up uh, during his convalescence from his plane accident, his six month convalescence, what he decided to do was to invite Harvard professors to his hospital room. He didn't have to do this, but he invited Harvard professors to his hospital room to tutor him on the major issues so that when he returned to the Senate, he would be a better informed and better Senator. And, and I, I, well, I interviewed John Podesta for the book, who most of you, well, the mm. students wouldn't know this, but he was at one time, you know, chief of staff for, for Bill Clinton and is a, was a major political operative. And, and he told me that when Kennedy would come in to talk with Clinton and try and get Clinton support for a bill or whatever, the fascinating thing was he would, he would come in with a, with a thick bill, thick piece of legislation, and he knew every paragraph. He knew everything. He had a photographic memory. He did become a master. And the idea that Ted Kennedy was the least intelligent of the Kennedys is something that I think is, uh, is just absurd because Kennedy worked so hard, so hard at being in command of everything. And that also includes oration because Ted Kennedy was not a natural orator. And he had some problems. In fact, he actually went to a speech therapist, as I describe it in the book, because he wasn't always fluid, but he worked at it and worked at it and worked at it so that he became an extraordinary orator. Uh, um, I think we're, uh, we're probably running up against the end of our um, session here. Stan, it looks like you had um, something to say if it's, if it's quick. Yeah, quick. Uh, uh, remark about Kennedy's fear, the fear of others around him, that he would be the third Kennedy to be oh. assassinated. I'll tell you, um, I always say uh, when I'm asked about uh, Ted Kennedy that he was a personal fatalist and a political uh, optimist, uh, and that I'm the exact opposite. I'm a personal optimist and a political fatalist. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was certain he was certain that he was going to be assassinated. Exactly. Absolutely certain. And it changed the way he approached life. Because he was such a fatalist, you know, he thought, well, I've got, I've got limited time. Thankfully, it turned out he didn't. I've got limited time. I've got to work harder. I've got to do more. I've got to cram it all in. I'm going to get shot. I'm going to be, you know, there's, there's somebody who's going to say, I'm going to get the third one. And it, it just, it, it so pervaded his life, this notion that he was going to die. He talked about it a, a, a fair amount among his intimates. Obviously, he could never talk about it in his family because his family was certain he was going to die. It was one of the reasons why he'd come to the brink of announcing for the presidency. And this happened several times. It was almost a quadrennial right. Ted Kennedy going up to the the very threshold of a candidacy and then pulling back because his family was certain were he to run, he would be assassinated. But he was certain of it. He was absolutely certain of it. And again, it, there, there's a fatalism. There's, there's a darkness to Ted Kennedy. There's a melancholy to him that is not the Ted Kennedy that he presented to the public, certainly. And it's not the Ted Kennedy 
that most journalists presented to the public. Yeah. It's a Ted Kennedy who emerges in my book because you can't understand Ted Kennedy without understanding that insecurity, that inferiority complex, that need, of, that, that need for redemption, that sense of fatalism. Uh, it's so deep in his bones that again, it pervades everything in his life. Yes, yeah. 